All right, some more breaking news here during the program. We'll get our war correspondent, our geopolitical expert, David Sachs. What are you seeing on the wire, Sachs? Well, there's a NATO meeting going on right now, and Blinken did a press conference where he says that Ukraine will be joining NATO. That's the big news going viral right now. Ukraine will become a member uh, of NATO. Uh, our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership uh, and uh, to create a clear pathway for, uh, for Ukraine uh, moving forward. But, uh, of course, we believe that Ukraine deserves to be a member of NATO and that this should happen sooner rather, sooner, sooner rather than later. Chamath, any thoughts on this flip that just broke during the program? Well, we just, I think NATO just added Sweden, right? And it was done in pretty record time from application to admission. So I would like to know whether, is this just rhetoric to just keep everybody at bay and placate the Ukrainians? Or is this real? The problem that this creates is that if it is real and they're admitted, then NATO has to defend Ukraine, which means that then America and all the other NATO allies would have to fight, which means that we're in a war. America should not be in a war. Just to give you the exact facts, you are correct. Sweden and Finland applied to join in May 2022 following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And uh, they had been neutral, as you know, for many decades. Finland has a massive land border with Russia, and they joined in April of 2023 after applying in May of 22, so just a year later. And Sweden became a member in March of 2024, just two years later, after its membership was held up by both Turkey and Hungary. Sachs, you are a resident expert on Ukraine and all things geopolitical. Your thoughts? On the one hand, what Blinken is saying is more of the same here, because it's been the administration's policy to seek to bring uh, Ukraine into NATO since they took office. They've reiterated that over and over again. And it's one of the major reasons for this war is that the Russians said over and over again, this was a red line for them. That's why there's a war in Ukraine. The idea that you're going to be able to bring Ukraine into NATO, however, when the war is going so badly, is now entering the territory of being delusional. I mean, this is like a delusional comment. And if you just want to understand how badly things are going, look at yesterday's Politico, which was called Ukraine is at great risk of its front lines collapsing. The source for this article was high-ranking uh, Ukrainian officials close to Zeluzhny, who's the former commander-in-chief. Some people have speculated that Zeluzhny himself might be the source, but at a minimum, it's high-ranking Ukrainian officers who reported to Zeluzhny. And what they say in this article is that the prognosis in Ukraine is grim. They say that the sad truth is that even if the funding bills approved by the U.S. Congress a massive resupply may not be enough to prevent a major battlefield upset. They say that there is a great risk of the front lines collapsing wherever Russian generals decide to focus their offensive, which people expect in the next few months. And there's nothing that can help Ukraine now because there are no serious technologies able to compensate Ukraine for the large mass of troops Russia is likely to hurl at us. This is a quote from one of the Ukrainian officials. We don't have those technologies and the West doesn't have them as well in sufficient numbers. So what they're saying is that even if the funding bill goes through the 61 billion, it's not going to be enough to save Ukraine. And at the very moment that that is now being finally honestly reported by Western media, it's something I've been saying now for months, finally, the truth is coming out. You have Blinken doubling and tripling down on these comments that nevertheless, Ukraine will be joining NATO. And Chamath is right. Under Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all. Therefore, if Ukraine becomes part of NATO, an attack on Ukraine by Russia, which is currently ongoing, will be considered an attack on the United States. Then you have to add to the mix the fact that Macron and other European leaders have actually been advocating for NATO to send in ground troops. And he said this over and over again. He's doubled down on this multiple times. So you have a dynamic now where this isn't just hot rhetoric by Blinken. This really has the risk of tipping over into policy, I would say in a Biden second term, where Biden agrees to do what our European allies are already calling for, which is send in NATO troops to Ukraine to save Ukraine from what Politico calls an imminent collapse. 
I think this is a very dangerous situation. I mean, what we're really talking about here is World War III. So if you want to have a serious chance of World War III in the next four years, then I would say go ahead and vote for Biden in November. I mean, this is just very clear to me. I'm personally not willing to accept that risk. I'm not willing to accept a 10% or 1% risk of that chance. But I think Blinken, putting it on the table here, I think people should be deeply concerned about this. And there should be a lot of follow-up questions for Blinken and the administration about this. Freeberg, should the free country of Ukraine be able to join NATO on some timeline, or should they be banned from ever joining NATO? Well, I think the statements are correct that Ukraine joining NATO escalates conflict, and we will find ourselves in a de facto global conflict, world war. Now, the question is, is that the, the cycle, the natural cycle? I will, once again, Nick, pull it up, please. Reference Ray Dalio and his <laughs> typical big cycle behind empires rise and decline. As he spoke at length with us in person about at the All-In Summit last year, he points out that the era of prosperity that over the last 500 years, we've seen six major empires go through is followed by a debt bubble, which uh, drives a wealth gap, which ultimately leads to economic challenges, which means printing more money, which is the cycle we are going through right now with a, as you guys know, two to $3 trillion annual deficit and explosion in um, federal debt levels. And that ultimately leads inevitably to external conflict, to war. Now, the particular motivations in every case, in all six times this has happened in the last 500 years, look different when you read the history books about what were the circumstances that drove us to external conflict, that drove that nation to war. Mm. But the truth is, every single one of them was preceded by a debt bubble, income inequality, wealth gap, and the printing of money. And there's a relationship between those economic factors and a desire for conflict. And I think that is what we are seeing play out over the past couple of years, starting with our um, motivated interest in supporting Ukraine against uh, the Russia conflict, and now escalating it towards inviting Ukraine to join NATO to escalate the conflict itself. Now, I think there's a notion that having a war is stimulating, having a war is unifying. This would be having the a wag war, the door, wag the dog theory. I, I don't think it's a wag the dog theory as much as it is. What do you do when the economic condition of the na nation is such that the federal government has to print money to support the economy and or to bridge the wealth gap? And when under those circumstances, in order to unify the country, in order to motivate a system of unification amongst a fracturing society or fracturing economic strata, you feel like you have to have an external enemy and that the notion of war itself is economically stimulating. I think that those are the motivating factors that we've seen play out six times in the last 500 years, and we may be unfortunately seeing play out here again. As we talked to Graham Allison, Ray Dalio mm. about last year, we said, what can we do to avoid this? That there have been times historically where these things have been avoided, but if we're not being cognizant of what's going on here and motivating a different tact and a different path, whether it's through our electoral cycle or through being loud and vocal in whatever media channels we each have access to, to make folks more aware of this, I think, you know, we will find ourselves walking down this path of looking for global conflict and finding it. Jamath, you look like you wanted to chime in there, yeah. Of the three presidential candidates, to be very clear, one is supportive then of some kind of confrontation because by proxy, they're supportive of admitting Ukraine into NATO, which would create a war. And two are pretty clearly anti-war. And just for people who know, the uh, boom-bust cycle behind empires rise and declines you can see that if you're on the, the YouTube video, but the sixth of eight moments is revolutions and wars, as uh, Freeberg's pointing out. There are two more that come after that, debt and political restructuring, and then the new world order emerges. And so the question here, I guess, becomes, can diplomacy win the day? And then is Blinken's point that they eventually can become a member or that they're imminently going to become a member? And it's breaking news, so we don't know if he's speaking 
about well, this. Well, clearly, that, let's just be really clear on this. The words he used were very carefully chosen. Yeah. And that means that there was a media and press strategy conversation that was had by him and his staff, which obviously found its way into the White House administration and that there was an executive conversation about this. For sure. This is the positioning we need to now be clearly stating, which means that this is now policy. He did not slip up on those words. This was not some yeah. off the cuff comment. This no. was clearly a media trained statement, which means that it is it is administration policy. And it was delivered that's, during that's being press delivered conference. By him. Exactly. At the next White House press conference, you will hear the question asked by reporters, is this the White House uh, position? And they will say, yes, it is. Yeah. And just to be clear, that e- that video had a couple of edits in it, and we don't have the full press conference here. The quote from The Hill is, Ukraine will become a member of NATO, period. Our purpose at the summit is to help build a bridge to that membership, which then seems like this would, this would if you're building a bridge, that takes time. So maybe they mean over time, the fullness of time. I, 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 to be able to do this in the next year would be, if it was on the timeline of Finland, would be insane. I, I cannot It disagree. would be insane, but they're not ruling it out. And I think you have to look at the context of what's happening. He's making these remarks as all the news from the battlefield is terrible. Ukraine is losing and it's at risk of collapsing. And European leaders like Macron are therefore calling for direct NATO intervention in the war. Hmm. So for Blinken to be making this sort of statement is really adding fuel to the fire. And let's see if he walks it back. Let's see if he clarifies it. I predict that he won't. Because this is an administration I predict a policy. clarification for sure, because this does not feel like it'd be good for voting because the war is incredibly unpopular. It'll make the election pretty simple. Every other issue, all the social issues that we fight about will fall away. The debt will fall away. The border will fall away. If this is true, if it's true yeah. does America want to go to war? Well, Chamath, I think, I think we're already at that point, even if there is some sort of clarification. And the reason I say that is because Biden clearly is very committed to this Ukraine policy. It didn't just start when he became president. It started when he became vice president and was managing the Ukraine portfolio for Obama. This is why Hunter Biden got that job in Ukraine, because Biden was running the show there. And they have been very committed to this idea of bringing Ukraine into NATO for decades. I mean, he supported when he was a senator. So this is not like Freeberg said, this is not like just some randomly chosen words out of the blue. Blinken measures his words carefully. He knows what he's saying. And this is something that Biden clearly is passionate about. And what you have to believe is that in a Biden second term, he's going to manage this whole uh, situation so perfectly that this war is not going to escalate any further. And I just, I have no confidence in that. Remember, if you want to use a historical analogy, go back to Woodrow Wilson in 1916. He was elected on literally the catchphrase, he kept us out of war. Less than one year later, we were in World War I. World War I, yeah. So this idea of, well, Biden wouldn't possibly get us into a war. I mean, history shows otherwise. History shows that presidents, once they win re-election, are more likely to get us into war rather than less because they don't have to fear voters. So then the question is, well, what is in Joe Biden's heart? What's he passionate about? He is clearly passionate about this cause about bringing Ukraine into NATO, and certainly not having Ukraine collapse or lose this war. Whereas Trump and Bobby Kennedy have both said that they will end this war, they will seek a peace deal if elected. I think that's enough right there. Yeah, I mean, and obviously, Lincoln and Biden are looking for peace as well. They just don't want to lose the war. Moving no, they're not on. looking for peace. I disagree oh, I, with I that. I think they are definitely looking for peace. You can disagree, but oh, they really? definitely want peace. And Why did they reject the deal at Istanbul at the beginning of this war? Yeah, yeah, because they, uh, I think, don't want Russia to determine who gets to be in NATO and they want free countries to decide. Is which, that worth you know, going to war for? I mean, th- that is, I guess, the existential question here is at what point do we want to let free democracies determine their future and protect them from invading countries? That is like actually the core of this is do you believe in democracy? Do you believe free countries should have the autonomy to pick their future? And is that worth fighting for? That is the question the world faces right now. I think that framing, I think that framing is not totally accurate. I think, of course, those things are good and right things. I think the thing is, on the balance of issues, there are seasons when certain priorities need to be shaped by a country. And right now, we're in a season where there's tremendous domestic instability. 
in our country. And and in, our balance in our country, sheet, you're saying? In our country, yeah. yeah, yeah. In our okay, balance sheet is breaking. So I think the question isn't that is democracy important? Of course it's important. It's how relatively important is it abroad relative to these domestic issues here? Yeah, that, I, I never right. agree with that. Is it, is it, hold on, let me just finish. Is it worth fighting for is the issue? And is it worth fighting for when you don't have the resources to do it? Now, if we were sitting here and a country next to Ukraine was invaded, say Finland or say France or another country in Europe was invaded, we would absolutely go to bat for them. But for Ukraine, we won't go to bat for them. They're not part, part of NATO. And, you know, th this is the when you issue say go of to bat, our time. Are you, saying, are you saying send American soldiers? Because that's what we're talking about. If France or Finland was in, would you be opposed if France, were, if Russia invaded France, would you defend France? Would you be in favor of the Of US course, that's our, Article five, that's our Article 5 okay. guarantee under NATO. This is why I don't want to extend an Article 5 guarantee to Ukraine, because exactly. it will put us directly in conflict with Russia. And I'm not interested in being in World War Three. Right. And then so Finland and Sweden come up. And I guess the argument would be, would you be in favor of sending troops to defend Finland and Sweden, the latest members of NATO? And would you be in favor of them? Now we're committed. Them? Now yeah. we're committed. And were you in favor of them joining NATO, I guess, is the next question. Should We Finland discussed it on the pod. I explained yeah. that it was creating a liability, not an asset. But what's done is done. Should free countries be able to join NATO, I guess, is at the end of the well, day. I think the that's an excellent here. question, actually. Yeah. Let, me make, let me make two points on that. The first one is countries don't have a right to join NATO any more than I have a right to join Augusta Country Club. Just because <laughs> I'm a golf player doesn't mean I get to join Augusta, okay? It's up to the current membership of Augusta or NATO to decide whether yeah. they're going to admit a country based on what is in their interest. It has never been in our interest to make Ukraine security dependent of the United States. Sorry, this is the reality. The second thing I want to point out is that what was Russia demanding? They were demanding Ukrainian neutrality. They were not basically looking to conquer Ukraine. They wanted them to be neutral. So Ukraine did not have to give up its freedom, okay? They just had to agree to be neutral. That was the key issue. That's what makes it very different than some other historical analogies. And that was not acceptable to us. At the very beginning of the war, Blinken said that we would insist on an open door policy. We would Yeah, clearly the right move here would have been to kick the can down the road and just tell Putin, we'll take it off. We'll take NATO off the table for 10 years or 20 years, and then we could have outlasted Putin. You and that I agreed on that. You yeah, and much better I agreed move. on that before the war started. And yeah, then the just, minute the war started, everyone forgot that that was the key casus belli of this war. Just the, more diplomacy is better. 